，只能用中文。嗯、um, ，He'll just speak in his native language Chinese <笑>。我还是把这个话题首先回到这个片子上来。这个影片呢，我是第三次看，前面两次都是在我们家看的。呃，副导让我请了中国的一些知名的学者。在我家放过两次这个片子，让大家来讨论这个话题。So he wants to first share some of the feedback about the movie. The first two times he saw the movie three times altogether. First two times were held in his home, and、uh, the director Fu invited several scholars from China to have discussion after the screening at his home. 这次感谢亚伟能够把这个片子的首场。呃，在美国，我们这次巡回放映的首场放在卡特中心，我也很高兴。呃，因为我们放这个片子的呃很重要的一个目的，就是为了说，在美国的新总统选出来之后，中美关系会是什么样的走向？我们用这个片子来做一个由头来讨论。Actually, this screening is the first stop of her tour in the States,、um, and they choose the first stop to be at the Carter Center, and that's something、uh, Miss Zhou is really delighted about, and they wanted to discuss, by having this tour, they wanted to open the dialogue with all of us about where the Sino-U.S. relation is going in the future by learning from the past. 一九七九年，邓小平七十四岁、七十五岁的时候，其实不到七十五岁啊。那个时候，他刚刚掌握了中国的大权，他来到了美国，为打开中美之间的僵局做出了很大的贡献。这是一九七九年，二零一六年，七十岁的川普当上了总统，美国总统。他能不能够成为像邓小平一样打开中美现在僵局的人呢？我们要拭目以待。In 1979, when Deng Xiaoping was 75 years old, he became the vice premier of China and made tremendous effort to normalize the relationship between China and the states. And in 2016, Mr. Trump became to be. The president of the Amer、uh, United States of America, where he would be having the same、um, vision, courage, and to carry on that torch and still、uh, have the contribution to enhance U.S.-China relations. That's the answer. Only time can tell. Uh, 因为时间关系呢，我想讲的简短一点。呃，另外呢，我也希望朱颖小姐。他翻的也简单一点，他允许他偷工减料。嗯、uh, ，because of the time constraint, Mr. Zhou will try to be concise. 呃，我这次到美国，到亚特兰大，我是第一次来。呃，但是两年以前，我曾经有过一次经历，差一点来，因为那次我在纽约买好了到。亚特兰大的飞机票来看刘亚伟，也订好了在亚特兰大的房子。那天呢，正好碰上纽约天气预报说有大雪，接我的司机说我不能再到机场去接你了，怕有大雪。那我就不敢去了，因为我第二天要回北京。结果我等了一晚上，雪也没下来。这个一晚上的功夫，地上只盖了薄薄的一层雪，所以把我的机票什么都浪费了。从那次我就觉得，呀，美国的这个预报实在是太不准确了。Uh, it's his first time to visit Atlanta. Actually, two years ago, there is a chance when he almost wanted to come. He booked a hotel and had all the agreements and everything. But then, according to the weather report,、uh, at that time it's supposed to be a really heavy snowstorm, so he had to cancel the flight. But then the next morning, when he woke up, actually he found there's really thin, like barely covered by snow on the ground. So that's something he learned from the last trip that the weather report over here is not really、uh, something he could believe in at all. 但是我想这次美国的大选和
两年前的天气预报其实是一样的。But he, he realized that the prediction of this electoral、um, presidential election is similar with the weather report two years ago. 呃，当然我在想，呃，川普是不是当选，呃，是一个问题，呃，民调预测准不准是另外一个问题。In fact, whether Trump will become the president is one issue, and whether we could believe in the、uh, prediction of the poll is another. Trump 当选反映的是美国社会的撕裂，呃，和由于收入以及以收入为核心的其他的问题，比如说社保啊、医疗啊、失业等等问题更加严重，而且看不到现在的政客能够真正改变的决心和手段。The election of Trump actually reflect a lot of social issues, including the social divisiveness, unemployment,、um, and the social welfare, reflecting that the current government was not able to have the real strategy or、uh, systematic methodology to solve the problem. 傅忠心真是，人家好容易他有一个跟我那么近的机会，非得给我话筒。<笑>啊，不过这个不用犯啊。嗯，预测的不准确，我觉得问题在于精英圈和草根圈的越走越远，各说各话。And we couldn't really believe in the prediction of the poll reflects another issue, which is that the elite circle is really going to another poll to the grassroots circle, and that's the divide or polarity among those two circles. 但是我觉得现在，我我我主张不要用再多的精力去探讨为什么我们预测不准了。But he believes that we should spend less effort on analyzing why the poll is not really accurate. 我觉得可以有少量的专业人士在探讨这个问题，大量的专业人士应该讨论下一步应该做什么。Of course, we should have、uh, some. Specialists still discussing and finding out why the poll has the misleading effect on people, but still there are more people need to spend efforts、um, figuring out what to do the next. 我觉得首先要接受事实，接受现实，就是要在川普当总统这个前提下，我们来探讨他能够在多大程度上来兑现他的竞选的诺言。哪些是说说而已，哪些是真的要做的？ Uh, a lot of effort need to spend on figuring out what we can believe in Trump's promise and what are just things he say to win the votes and what are really his strategy that's going to be implemented. 另外要了解新总统身边的行政团队和智囊团队。主要都是哪些人？他们历史上看他们的观点是什么 ？We need to understand better who the administrative team and advisory team that will be helping Ms. Trump and their historical background. 另外，现任总统和国会等机构能不能在最近这几个月的看守和交接过程中，把一些制度更加健全起来？ And in this transitional period, whether the Senate and Congress can really help to enhance the current system. 在一个难以预测的大选中选上一个难以预测的总统，对于美国人民，甚至对于全世界人民来说，都充满了变数。In an unpredictable election with an unpredictable candidate to win the campaign, it has a lot of implication for not only the states but also the world. 但是，也许正因为如此，就会有更加健全的制度来做出某些限制。And let's hope that a healthier system will be evolving out of this situation. 我就想起二零一零年、一一年的时候，中国那时候有一个薄熙来，当时盛传他要进入中央常委。Here, probably we all knew that in 2010 and 2011, there's a lot of、uh, words saying that Bo Xinlai in China was going to be one of the member of Politburo Standing Committee. 大多数中国的精英都表示反对
most of the elite in China actually against that、uh, opinion or possibility. 但是有一个很著名的历史学家，他跟我说他支持。And actually, a famous historian told Mr. Zhou that he was supportive of that possibility. 他认为薄熙来是一个不安分的人，他就像带来一种鲶鱼效应。这个会，呃，会使得这潭死水活起来。Um, according to that historical、uh, historian, Bo Xilai is someone who is unpredictable. So by him joining the Politburo Standing Committee, it might be possible for him to bring some、uh, new dynamics. 这样就会有呃更加成熟的法律和制度来约束他，同时也约束了其他的领导人。And the whole system might, because of that, become to be more healthy and complete to have the checks and balance. 我想，也许川普就是一条鲶鱼。And let's hope、uh, Miss Trump will have the same effect. 当然，作为一个中国人，我们更关心的是川普上台以后的对华政策。And of course, as a Chinese, the thing that we care the most is about the policy toward China after. 尽管他说过很多对中国不友好的话，但是很多中国人还是投票选他，包括在美国的有选举权的华裔。Although Mr. Trump had a lot of negative remarks about China, there are a lot of、uh, Chinese people still voted for him, especially、uh, Chinese people over in the states. 我觉得这些中国人喜欢川普的原因无非是两个，一个是川普是个实商人，是个实用主义者。中国人喜欢跟实用主义者打交道，认为他们原则性不强，在利益面前可以让步。So according to、um, Mr. Zhou, he believes the reasons for most Chinese people who voted for Mr. Trump is because of two reasons. One, Trump is a businessman; he's pragmatic, and that means he can yield to some principles or pragmatic interests. 第二个就是川普现在关于国际问题的一些看法。表明他上台以后可能会采取所谓门罗主义或者孤立主义的外交政策，用更多的精力来处理美国的国内问题，这样就在国际舞台上让出了一个空间，给中国人留出来空间。And the second reason might be Trump is more prone to the isolationism, so in which case he would probably focus more efforts、um, in domestic affairs and might have more space for China. 当然，现在这些都是未知数。我认为呢，我们最主要的，其实要要中对于中国人来说，可能对于美国人、中美之间来说，可能要解决这样几个问题。首先是要增强互相了解、相互了解。Of course, all those are still something uncertain, but we do need, we can do some things, including one to enhance mutual understanding between the states and China. 因为川普是属于横空出世的，呃，很多人没有想到他会当总统，因此，对于中国人来说，对他的了解非常少。据我所知，大家对他的了解只限于他的房地产和他的商业经验。And because Trump won the election all of a sudden, so Chinese people in general don't know him that well. Most of people, of course, know only about his real estate experiences, and other than that, not. Many are familiar with Chinese people. I recently saw a book in our house when I was reading it in 2008. I think it was very interesting. It was written in 2008. So when he was collecting, reorganizing home, especially the books, he found a book published eight years ago in 2008. It's a book on experiences of Trump as a real estate. 当然，对于川普来说，我认为他也是没有外交经验和国际政治经验的人，他也应该对中国有所了解。嗯，有，没有？没有。Okay. Um. So, and on Trump's side, because he didn't really have much diplomatic experience, so he probably doesn't know China that much either. 为了要互相了解，就要建立一定的渠道。据我了解呢，中美之间的渠道其实是非常畅通的。To enhance mutual understanding, of course, we need to have open channels to really have open communication. 
And according to Ms. Zhou, the channels between the states and China has always been pretty open. 但是这个渠道主要还是信息沟通的渠道，而不是传递友谊的渠道。But those channels are mostly for only communicating information rather than building friendship. 我认为非常重要的是要建立两国最高领导人之间的个人的友谊，就像刚才这部片子里是邓小平所说的。It is critical for the leaders of two countries to really build friendship. Just as what we saw from the movie. 起码要建立像现在的习近平总书记和普京之间的友谊。At least they should form the friendship to the level of what the President Xi and Putin are enjoying among them. 当然还有半年以前的朴槿惠。韩国总，就是或者半年以前的朴槿惠，南韩。Uh, and there's another example of the uh, half years ago, the South Korea's president meeting with President Xi. 另外，我觉得可能呃，新总统上任以后，应该尽快的推动高层互访和最高领导人的这样的一个呃会面。Once Trump uh, gets to to the White House. Two countries should have a series of meetings among the high officials. 呃，另外一个因素呢，我觉得还是要推动呃智库之间的交流。Another thing is we need to enhance more interactions and uh visitings among think tanks between two countries. 最近几年来，我们每年都和像布鲁金斯、CSIS， 还有外交事务委员会。东西方研究所这样一些美国的智库，我们都跟他们每年都有很多交流。呃，我认为智库现在不知道新总统会用哪个智库，原来的肯定都会地位发生变化，所以我希望卡特中心能够成为呃这个更加重要的一个智库力量。呃、uh, ，so every recent years, every year, Ms. Zhou will come to visit. Quite some uh, famous American think tanks in the states, including Brookings and East West Institute, and he hopes that the Carter Center can play a more critical role into this uh, exchange. And also, among with the elect, with Trump going to the White House, the ranking of the think tank and which think tank he will be relying on is still something we don't know yet. But because of all those uncertainty, the Carter Center might be able to play a more constructive role. 我觉得最后一个就是在以上的基础上呢，呃，应该双方都应该更加清楚的梳理和阐述自己的核心利益在什么地方。Through those exchanges, it's possible for the United States and China to be more clear about which, uh, where is the core interest. Of each country is. 我们现在的问题呢，就是核心利益太多。比如说，对于中国来说，南海是核心利益，钓鱼岛是核心利益，呃，中国国内的稳定是核心利益，共产党的长期执政也是核心利益，这些利益都非常的多。So right now we have a problem that we all have too many core interests, and for example, take China as an example. We have the South China Sea as the core interest. We have uh, uh, some other things, but we don't really have that priority. So, I, uh, 前几这几年一直在跟那些智库的人交流，比如说中美之间要建立一种新型大国关系，这是中国反复提出来的。然后，这个杰夫贝德和李凯如就每次都在跟我说。中国的和中国的这个新型大国关系里面到底是什么内容，我们不知道。你只是一个口号。So some of the misunderstanding also caused by the uh, lack of clarity. For example, the new type of superpower relations, and he heard uh, Ms. Jo heard from Jack Bay saying that we heard about this concept a lot of times. But really, what does that mean? We're still not clear. 呃，中美之间的关系，我觉得很微妙。这个历史上曾经非常友好，最近呢又问题重重
the relationship between China and the States uh, is subtle. It has been had its own honeymoon <coughs> period, but recent years actually it becomes to be a bit intense. 新总统上任我觉得是一个契机这个契机我们要抓住这个契机这个中国有句老话这个运动场上也常用叫换人如换刀换人的时候是最容易突破一种旧的关系的时候所以我觉得我们要抓住这个关系这个重要的关节点 Trump becomes to be the president actually it's a good opportunity for Sino-US relations There is an old saying in China says to replace a person is similar with replacing a knife. So that's how powerful it can be for a new person to be in this position. Uh, thank you very much. So you all make your own judgment in terms of how he has uh, responded to my assignment. Uh, so we're going to move on to our next speaker. I also made an assignment uh, to our next speaker, uh, Hank Levine. Uh, my assignment to him, of course, you know, in the context of the unexpected outcome of the election, it may have also changed it. My assignment to him is in the wake of the election, uh, in the U.S. debate in terms of relationship with China, there is the engagement camp and there is the containment camp. You know, which camp is going to be on the rise? So the floor now is uh, to Mr. Levine. Thank you, and uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Uh, thanks uh, to Yahweh, the Carter Center, and particularly to Chairman George Rasheen and John Dwan for the, the chance to be here and inflict uh, my views on all of you. Um, I come from, I grew up in the New York City area, and so I tend to speak quickly, which is probably helpful in this case, because we do have time constraints. Uh, as, as we've heard already from uh, Chairman Joe and, and as, as, as we've talked about, there is uh, a tremendous amount of concern about the future of U.S.-China relations uh, in the Trump administration. And I know Shannon, uh, who will speak next, is going to explain to us exactly how that will play out. But, <laughs> but, but, but it's important to, to understand that unlike uh, President Nixon or unlike even President Carter, uh, President Trump is not starting with a blank slate. He is not starting with a new relationship. Uh, he is inheriting a set of attitudes and actions and policies, including many factors that I believe will continue to color the relationship uh, for quite some time. Uh, the fact is uh, that I think, uh, and you have to forgive me because my worldview is a little narrow. I live and work inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and so. Uh, I really reflect kind of the, the policy world there. And I think it's fair to say that uh, over the last uh, six to eight years, and particularly over the last uh, two to three years, there has been a significant turn toward the negative uh, in views by the policy community in Washington toward China. When I say policy community, I mean China hands uh, in government, uh, in the business community, and, and including in the think tanks. In fact, I would uh, assert that in certain ways, in a certain way, the U.S.-China relationship is the worst that it has been since Richard Nixon stepped off that plane uh, in Beijing in February of 1972. Uh, and, and this is based on a number of factors which I believe will, will persist. And they are factors that will underlie uh, the, the Trump policy, or that 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 will be significant uh, as Trump develops his policy. Um, put it in the simplest terms, China is is now seen as much more threatening to the United States than it used to be. Uh, this gets to Yahweh's comment about the engagers versus those who want to contain China, and I think it's fair to say the containment type people, those who see China as a threat have been on the rise. Uh, and and uh, there are issues in this regard, by the way, on the Chinese side and Chinese attitude toward the US, but I'll focus uh, on the US perspective. And I will cite, how many is my list? Six factors that I believe have developed in recent years that are driving uh, this perception of China as a threat. First has been China's growing military strength. Uh, I, I think that 
you know, that factor is overstated sometimes, including by some in our defense community who want a bigger budget, uh, particularly for the U.S. Navy and Air Force. Uh, but nonetheless, China's military capabilities are growing substantially, and, and that causes fear. Uh, number two, as we saw uh, in the election just completed, the anti-trade and anti-globalization wave uh, is now strongly felt uh, across the United States. And though I think it's somewhat unfair, the fact is uh, there is a lot of focus on China as, as a leading uh, sort of participant in the damage that globalization is alleged uh, to be causing in the U.S. So China has a great job killer. Uh, again, in my view, much overstated, but a, a deeply held view. Uh, number three, uh, interestingly, the big multinational companies, the household names, the Fortune 500 companies, have always been uh, the biggest supporters of U.S.-China relations. I always like to refer to them as sort of the ballast that has kept U.S.-China relations uh, steady. Uh, in recent years, that ballast has been lightened somewhat. Uh, in other words, uh, although the big U.S. multinationals generally continue to do pretty well in China, uh, the fact is there is a growing anxiety among the big multinationals about the outlook for their continued participation in China and the growing sense that uh, the Chinese government increasingly is intervening in ways that are intended to help build up Chinese companies to better compete with foreign companies or put foreign companies at a disadvantage. And these big companies now, while supportive of US-China relations, reflect their anxiety and their concern both to the Congress and uh, and the administration, and, and therefore China in this realm uh, is also increasingly seen as a threat to US competitiveness. Number four, uh, clearly the human rights situation in China has deteriorated in recent years. Uh, this is not a threat to the US per se, but, but nonetheless it, 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 it plays into this story that China is a bad guy, China is a bad actor. And so the human rights situation plays. Number five, China under President Xi Jinping has become more assertive uh, in the world, whether that's the South China Sea, whether it's the desire to establish new institutions that China leads, like the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank or the One Belt, One Road uh, project. Uh, and while I happen to think those projects are you know, probably positive and, and certainly not negative. Nonetheless, this is viewed by some as threatening. Uh, China now trying to spread its tentacles out uh, through the world. Number six, uh, and maybe somewhat more controversially, in my view, uh, unfortunately, our current president and national security advisor have uh, lost the kind of strategic vision and desire to manage China policy that every one of their predecessors had. And if you think about Nixon and Kissinger and you think about President Carter and Brzezinski uh, and you think about Bill Clinton and Sandy Berger and, and on and on, uh, that really has been lost. And it's not that they're anti-China, but in my view, they just are not that focused and not trying to manage uh, the overall US government approach to China and therefore, this, this, those who are always inclined to be fearful of China, the defense community, national security community, and so on, uh, their concerns are allowed to fester. Uh, on top of all this, let me say, we're, we're now, due to this rise in concern about China, we're having what I think of as a kind of a revisionist view of, of our China policies, with voices increasingly saying, not only are things bad now, but you know, uh, the policy the United States have pursued for 40 years under multiple administrations was wrong. And, and we told you it was wrong, and the result today is a repressive China that's a threat to the United States. Uh, you've been doing it wrong all along. I, I have a very big problem uh, with that analysis. I, and of course, the point is that we therefore need a dramatic change. And my problems with the analysis are three. Number one, let's not forget 
that the U.S. policy uh, has resulted in the last 40 years in unprecedented peace and prosperity in the East Asia region. Uh, and, and the burden on those who say this, that President Carter's policy was wrong, President Clinton's policy was wrong, the burden on them is to show that they have an alternative that would have produced better results, that somehow isolating China, keeping it separate, would have resulted in, in better results. Number two, uh, while China certainly has moved in, in negative directions in recent years in many ways, it, it, it is not uh, Germany under Hitler, it is not the Soviet Union. In other words, it is not out to conquer the world, destroy the United States. It is a country with which we have significant differences, but at the same time still enormous areas of cooperation that are making things better for both countries and for the world. And number three, history has not stopped in China as far as I'm aware. And, and you know, for people to say, you see, we told you all along, this is the real China. I say, look, I, I don't know where China's going to be in five years, and I don't know where China's going to be in 25 years. Uh, and, and, and therefore, let's not assume that China of today is, is set in stone forever. In fact, let me say in closing that the challenge that we have, and when I say we in this case, I mean both China and the United States, the top leadership, uh, the challenge we have is to continue a set of China policies or, or bilateral policies that recognize the ambivalent nature of the bilateral relationship and to avoid turning it into one of true hostility, which is to say, in my view, though the sort of containment type of voices are growing in the Washington policy community, I feel they're wrong. And, and, and going down that road would be tremendously uh, destructive. Doing what I suggest, a smart policy that recognizes the ambivalence will take a lot of nuance and sophistication, strong White House leadership that's backed by a true strategic vision. Can the Trump administration pull that off? Shannon is gonna tell us. Thank you. Um, Shannon, just uh, go ahead. I think the question is very well posed to you, and uh, everybody is looking forward uh, to your somewhat uh, definitive, not answer, answer. <laughs> well, given that the running theme of this panel is uh, how badly we've messed up on all our previous predictions, I'm a little nervous about this. Um, Trump is notoriously unpredictable, but having tried and gone through his remarks and some of his advisor's remarks, I'll give it my best shot. Um, the first most important thing to note is that Trump sees China almost exclusively in economic terms. Um, this should not be surprising. His background is as a businessman. He doesn't have any experience or expertise in foreign policy or um, security strategic issues. So most of his public comments um, and policy promises have been focused on China as an economic entity. Uh, most famously, he's promised, as Mitt Romney did, to declare China a currency manipulator on day one. Um, obviously, Romney lost, so we didn't have to deal with the fallout from that. Trump has won, so will he follow through on this promise? Um, that's something to watch for. He's also infamously uh, said he would slap massive tariffs on Chinese products, and um, more realistically, he's promised to aggressively pursue trade cases against China at the WTO which is something the Obama administration has already been doing. Trump would likely continue that, um, even step it up to somewhat, uh, to some extent. And uh, it's important to look at the broader context. There's already sort of um, a general backlash worldwide, um, as Hank noted, against globalization. A lot of this has turned to focus fairly or unfairly on China. So you're seeing countries in Europe start to be more critical of Chinese trade policies. Um, and America is now looking like it's going to be following down that path. And all of this comes when China's own economic growth is slowing down and Beijing can ill afford the sort of disruptions that Trump has promised to bring. Now, the Chinese response has mostly been, well, we've heard this before. Um, almost every president while campaigning has promised to get tough on China and really no one follows through because it's impractical um, and unrealistic to do that. 
The problem with Trump is I think we have to at least consider the possibility that he will follow through uh, for a couple of reasons. One is he's an iconoclast. Um, he ran as someone promising to shake up the Washington establishment. So he's not going to take the sort of policy limitations that other administrations have taken for granted. He's not going to take them for granted. Um, the other problem is these economic promises were really central to his appeal. Um, as Dr. Gerbovitz was telling us, he won support of white working class voters promising that he would make the economy work for them. So if he goes back on a lot of these trade promises, that would be more damaging to him than it would have been to another candidate. Um, one side note, uh, he has also promised to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the TPP. Um, part of his general skepticism that these free trade deals are good for America. Um, that would be good news for China because China is not part of that trade deal and then that would leave China free to pursue its own trade deals like the Regional Conference of Economic Partnership or the free trade area of the entire Asia Pacific that uh, both ideas Beijing is heavily promoting. The problem is, is Trump would also probably not be favorable toward the bilateral investment treaty that China is currently negotiating with the United States. So his attitude towards these trade deals um, also a mixed bag for China. Uh,